there's no better parallel to this entire journey that has been whistle kick and, and martial arts radio than that story. Not because I'm anybody particularly special, I just chose to jump in and do this. Hello everyone, it's episode 100 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists. My name's Daniel Hartz, and for this episode, I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick makes the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel. We'd like to extend a warm thank you to all of our returning listeners, and welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. If you're new to the show, or you're just not familiar with what we make, Check out our No Sweat Athletic shirts. You'll notice how comfortable they are and how they aren't too tight or too loose. They fit just right. They're great for working out or wearing under your uniform. We have lots of colors and sizes to choose from, so take a look. You can learn more about our gear and the rest of our products at whistlekick.com, and our gear is also available on Amazon. If you want the show notes, you can check those out over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. And while you're over there, get on the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, we'll never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a generous coupon. On episode 100, we hear from the Whistlekick founder and our regular host, Sensei Jeremy Lesniak. Throughout his martial arts career, he's achieved a black belt in no less than three different disciplines. A native to New England, Sensei Jeremy is a friend to many schools. Not just as a great resource for the best sparring gear, but someone you may see at a seminar, or a guest instructor. Sensei Lesniak started martial arts at a young age, but continues to demonstrate his passion for martial arts to this day. I've had the pleasure to work with him as a student in one of my seminars, and as a guest instructor in my home dojo. Without further ado, let's welcome Sensei Jeremy to the show. Sensei Lesniak, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks. So, I've heard you interview a lot of different people. That's true. And we've heard you hear other people's stories, but I think it's time that we get to know you a little bit. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history and the where, the when, the how, yeah, we want to hear that. So. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, it's really weird being on this side, on this side of this whole equation. It's kind of, it's, it's different. So I'll, you know, I, I can even feel that like my voice is different being asked the question versus asking the question. So uh, I will try to not make it too different, too weird. So. I started martial arts when I was four, and I've told this bits of this story before on here and on other shows, but I vaguely remember being four years old, being at the town beach, the public beach, and swimming. And for some reason, I remember having an Aquaman shirt on. Like, that was my favorite shirt that summer. I don't know why I remember that, but that was definitely there. And my mother calling me out of the water and introducing me to this woman and saying, She's starting karate classes. Do you want to learn karate? And me saying, sure. And having no idea what that meant. But it just, it, the, the energy and the way that the question was presented, it sounded like something I was supposed to agree to. You know, you're four. And do you want to have a root canal? You know, I mean, you can get a kid to agree to things when, when you have the right inflection. So... A couple months later, classes started in the, the community center, and my memory is pretty vague of that time, but I remember getting yelled at a lot for walking from knot to knot in the floorboards. Like, that was my focus. Like, wherever I stepped, I had to put my foot <laughs> on another knot in the board. Um, I recall years later, my instructors saying that they took me at four, and after I started, they wouldn't take anyone under six. <laughs> they kind of learned their lesson with me. Uh, so I stuck around at that school until I went to college. So there's 14 years, uh, earned my black belt there. 
And I know you have a, a black belt in many disciplines. What was this first sure. discipline? Um, so this school, I, I was pretty lucky. Um, it was two instructors, um, one having grown up in a Kyokushin karate and the other having grown up in Ishinru karate and they they got together and they got married and they opened the school together. So we had two sets of forms, kata, um, and two different ways of looking at things. Uh, I, I would say that just because of their personalities, the Kyokushin, which was Sensei Beth's uh, original style, kind of dominated uh, Ishinru for anybody that has seen Ishinru is not the um, sexiest style of karate. Really effective, and as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate it a lot more. But um, you know, so there's so the black belt was kind of in the in that school, you know, rather than one style versus the other. I, you know, at one point I knew all of the katas and actually working on relearning them now. So where we left off before I cut you off there yeah. was, was was you got to college. Got to college. Um, Went to college in part because I wanted to train with someone that I met on the tournament circuit, um, a gentleman who has actually been on the show. And I, I'm going to probably not use a lot of names because I don't want to just name drop all of these people that I've sure. reached out to to bring on the show. I don't want it to, to feel like that. That feels funny. Um, but in order to get to his school, I needed a car. And I didn't have a car the first two years of college. So uh, there was a karate club on campus, and it was this style that was basically Shotokan, but they didn't like to call it Shotokan. They liked to say it was something else. Um, and then there was a Capoeira club, so I did a couple years of that. That was a lot of fun. Finally get a car, go up the road to actually train Shotokan. And, and so I had four years there where I trained in three different schools and then moved to Vermont uh, for non-martial arts reasons. And decided, hey, I'm, I'm ready. I'm going to open my own school. So I, I moved in, found a spot, ran a school for a couple of years, and realized that I just didn't have the energy to dedicate to my students because I was trying to grow this other business, this non-martial arts business. And I couldn't do both. And I wasn't going to not give my students 100% because it just didn't feel right. I, I, I would have rather they go somewhere else. I heard an old proverb once that a fox that chases, chases two rabbits gets none. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's, that's definitely apropos here. I mean, I, I remember, you know, because if anybody that's worked as the owner of a startup business knows that, you know, it's not a nine to five or an eight to four, you know, this is like a, like a six to five endeavor. And then, you know, I, pick up classes at six o'clock and teach for two to three hours and just be fried. And I found myself dreading those days, not because I didn't love teaching. I mean, I love teaching and, um, you know, you've been in classes with me, you, you know, I, I, I dig it. I mean, I really love sharing what I know, um, or at least I, what I pretend to know. And there just, there wasn't enough Jeremy to go around. So that was tough. So shut that down. There was a lot of tears there and kind of floated on my own for a couple years. And there, um, the irony is that the town that I moved to in Vermont um, prior to me had two martial arts schools. Um, so with, with, you know, this town of 5,000 people had three martial arts schools. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And uh, after a couple years of realizing I got to do something, I got to, I, I'm not motivating myself to train. You know, I was in my, my mid-20s and just didn't have that fire without someone yelling at me, telling me what to do. I needed that. So um, I, I lucked out. Uh, no disrespect to the other because I know the people there. But for me, for my personality and my needs, I picked the right one and uh, still call that gentleman my instructor today. Uh, and that was, of course, a Taekwondo school and... That was 2006. I want to say it was 2006 I started training there, so it's been a decade. Awesome. Well, you've accumulated a bunch of great stories just from the conversations you've been sharing with many of the guests you've had on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. But let's think about the stories that you've had for just Sensei Jeremy. 
Yeah. What What are the What are the things that help make you a martial artist? What, tell us about one of those stories. You know, I, I've known that this episode was going to come for a long time because you know, right around episode fifteen or twenty, people that were listening to the show were saying that they wanted to hear me on the other side of the mic. And I, I pushed it back as long as I could, in part because of this question, because I knew this was the question that, that I was going to struggle with the most. But I've also, as, as we were talking about before we started recording, I felt that everyone else's stories were great. And before I start recording with them, they tell me, oh, this, you know, all I have is lame stories. We'll be done in 15 minutes. And, you know, 90 minutes later, I'm trying to get them off the recording. So. Um, that's my long-winded delay from actually answering the question. I think the challenge that I have is that most of my stories aren't long. They're not wordy. They're really short. They're more anecdotes. Um, like when I started practicing bow staff, my arms were so short that I could barely hold the bow over my head. And the first time I worked partner bow work with my instructor, the bow didn't quite make it high enough over my head. And she came down not super hard. She wasn't trying to bust through my bow, but she was expecting the bow to be there and thunk, ran on top of my skull. You know, it was probably five. I mean, there's some dents. I mean, they may be from, from that night. Who knows? Um, I remember probably being eight and thinking it was a completely reasonable question to ask one of my instructors why we were practicing jump spinning crescent kicks at the end of class when we were all tired why we didn't do that at the beginning of class when we had more energy uh, receiving a lot of push-ups for doing that <laughs> um i was a pain in the butt you know i as i look back you know i was one of those students that probably really tried my instructor's patience uh, and the irony is, I of, of all of those people that started training back then, that day, or even in that year, to my knowledge, I'm the only one that still trains. I mean, dozens of people. You know, what is that saying? You know, one out of 100 people that start earn a black belt, something like that. And if those numbers would be believed, it's, it's a way lower ratio. Um, but if someone really pins me down and says, what's your favorite story around martial arts? I do have to bring in one of the guests um, to, to wrap that in. And that's, that's Bill Wallace. Um, so I was approached by, by someone else who has been on the show and said, you know, I've been looking at offering a, a Superfoot seminar, a Bill Wallace seminar. Would you want to partner with me on that? And I said, yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. Let's do that. So I was uh, down in Rutland, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did that in Rutland. So here it is. We're, uh, we're recording this June of, of 2016, and that was August of 2015 that we did that. And so someone else, a third person uh, that knew Superfoot said, you know, let, let's go. You can meet him and put down the deposit check and whatever. So, you know, there was some logistical stuff. And... I don't usually get starstruck. Like, I think it's cool when I meet somebody who's famous or whatever, but uh, I realized on the drive down, I was super nervous. And I didn't know why. I mean, like, I, I kind of knew why, but I knew, I mean, this isn't, this isn't a movie star. This is, this is an exceptional martial artist, and I'd met plenty of exceptional martial artists, or, or I, that's what I was telling myself. Um, and I was a blithering idiot. When I, when I actually met him the first time. So here I am, we're at this hotel in Connecticut and there's a, there's a few of us and uh, he's making jokes with me and anybody that's met Grandmaster Wallace knows he, he's a funny guy. He likes to pick on people, he likes to make jokes and he's just ripping on me. And normally I'll give it right back but I just didn't have the capacity to do that at that time because here I am and I'm realizing like, this is the greatest kicker of all time and he's picking on me. And I just couldn't wrap my brain around that 
kind of paradox. Because up until then, when I've when I had met famous martial artists, like they'd all been, you know, quiet and reserved and and I don't want to say respectful because that implies that he wasn't respectful and he absolutely was, but it was just it was a different vibe. And I'm not sure that I'm doing the best job explaining this. It was it was surreal. I think that's probably the best way. It was a surreal moment, and being in it was really hard for me to wrap my brain around. I've actually experienced that before with one of my favorite musicians. Okay, I I couldn't speak real words to him. Yeah, and it, and it was um, I, I had all these things that I wanted to say, but I just for some reason lost the motor skills in my mouth to really right. make it go from my brain through my mouth to actually interact the way I wish I could have. Right. And so part B to that story, because it continues to get more surreal, so we go from, I meet him, we talk logistics, we get the date booked, I write him a check, to he comes on the show, episode 14, in part to promote that we were doing that seminar. Um, And then what followed was, so at the seminar, I, I didn't get a chance to, to learn anything. I was working. You know, I was making sure everybody had what they needed. We had the kids first and then the adults. And so I'm, I'm working. I, I was on the floor for maybe 10 minutes. And that really bummed me out because it looked like fun stuff. So I reached out to uh, his uh, senior student in our area, um, Sensei Terry Dow who lives a couple hours away, and I just shot him a message and said, can I come down to your school for an hour? Can you just show me the basics of this stuff? Um, and he said, yeah, sure. So we picked a time, and I drove down, and we start working out, and 30 minutes in, he's like, you've got pretty good kicks. And I said, well, cool. It's quite a compliment coming from you. And then a few minutes later, he said, you know, we're having a superfoot testing up here in April. You should test. And I said, what? You, you want me to test for a black belt under, under Bill Wallace? Like, yeah. Uh, um, okay. So that kind of set out my path for the next few months and what I was working on behind the scenes. Uh, not that anybody on the show knew that. I go down the next week and he says, and, and uh, Sensei Terry says, Bill brings all of his black belts together in Florida every year or two to train. You should come with us. I said, you, you want me to go to Florida to train with all of the Superfoot black belts? He said, yes. And I said, oh, okay. So, wild. so here in a matter of, of like six months, I've gone from blithering idiot with this man to having a black belt with him and, and calling him my friend. And there's no better parallel to this entire journey that has been whistle kick and, and martial arts radio than that story. Not because I'm anybody particularly special. I just chose to jump in and do this. And these are the opportunities that presented themselves to me. And I, I honestly question on some days, do I really deserve them? Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to turn them down because they're fun as heck. But it's... You know the show The Greatest American Hero? Did you ever watch that yeah. show? Okay. The theme song? It's that. It, 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 it's that song. And if anybody doesn't know that song, you should go look that up. Maybe we'll link that in the show notes. I don't even know if I'm doing the show notes. Questions that we haven't answered yet. So... Martial arts affects us all differently. We all get our, we take away from it a unique experience, every single person. Every single person experiences a black belt differently. So how do you think martial arts, and these many experiences you've had, have made you a better person? Yeah. Um. 
one of the things that I'm, I'm committed to doing in this in this conversation is not throwing anybody under the bus. Um, I don't I don't like that, and and fortunately, most of the guests have not done that. They've at the very most implied certain people. Um, my childhood wasn't always the best. It was just my mom and I. She did the best she could. There were some challenges there. Um, as I alluded to, I may not have been the easiest child to raise, walking around stepping on the knots in the wood. But I had a lot of other role models, a lot of people in the dojo that helped raise me. Um, If you, if you follow the show, if you follow Whistlekick on social media, one of the things that you'll see from time to time is these, these quotes. And some of them are from other people, and you know, we always attribute whoever that is. But a lot of them come from me, and just these almost epiphanies I, I had. And one of them, I think, is really, really appropriate to, to what I'm trying to say. It takes a dojo a school to raise a martial artist I mean I think back on on these people that had such tremendous influence on not just my martial arts but my childhood because when you start so young I mean you're just you're really soft clay it's super easy to mold and had I been with a different set of people doing things differently I would have become a completely different person and I'm proud of who I am. So I thank these people for, for all of that effort, all, all of the things that they did. Um, I would have been a pretty angry person, I think. Um, I've got a pretty strong emotional side that I've learned through martial arts to channel pretty well. Um, but I, I think I would have ended up that stereotypical person that flies off the handle. I, I could see that have, having been me if I didn't have not just the outlet of martial arts, but the, the guidance of the people in it. Yeah, my, my school has been a really great source of community, mm -hmm. and community is so important for everyday human life. And I find martial, art, martial arts schools, like you're saying, really provide a unique community with unique support and they're helping you with discipline and listening to your, to your elders and listening to your peers and cooperation. It's really, I, I'm hearing all that from you. There's a, I, I think that difference comes from a couple of things. One, I mean, you're, you're hitting each other. I mean, when you, when you bleed, when you sweat, when you experience pain with someone, there's something uh, very deeply psychological. There's a connection that happens that you really can't ignore. And if anybody has ever trained with people that as individuals, they absolutely, I don't want to say hate, but strongly dislike, but still find themselves willing to work with them and finding them excellent training partners. I mean, I, I've had several people like that over the years. Like I would not want to hang out with them. In fact, wouldn't even want them to have dinner in my home. But I'll mix it up with them because they're they're great training partners and help me get better. And then the other piece being that that refusal refusal by the higher ranks to accept anything but respect. I think that that's really uh, guiding, especially for someone so young. So we just talked about some really awesome things that helped make you who you were, make you a better person. Now, all of us find points in our lives where the swings just keep coming at us. We get, we have, I mean, life happens. And when life happens, some people have other skills like martial arts that can help you through those moments. So why don't you tell us about how your martial arts training 
has helped you through a moment where life was particularly tough? So a black belt is somewhat a universal goal and for those that have attained it, a, a, a similar uh, experience that kind of that kind of binds us um, but different schools apply different meaning to it and and the school that I started in where I, where I earned my first black belt we didn't talk about what the test involved publicly and, and I'm gonna respect that and not talk about a lot of the specifics but one of the pieces that we did kind of let out was that once you earned your black belt, you knew you could do anything. And that wasn't something that I fully understood until I was older. I, I earned my black belt at 16. And to tell a 16 year old, you can do anything. I mean, you're, you already think that. Right. I mean, to be a teenager, you know, you're invincible, right? That's why so many kids get into so much trouble. But right out of college, I started my first business, as, as we talked about, and it was not martial arts related, it was computer related. I started a computer consulting firm um, two weeks after graduating college. And things went pretty well for a while, and managing that growth was tough. A year in, I had opened a second location. And at one point I looked up, I had like 15 employees. And then one day I took a really hard look at the books. I, um, so my office manager was telling me something was off. And we were broke. I mean, we were so far beyond broke. It was, it was just a stupid amount of debt. And I just wanted to curl up in a ball and cry. And I did, I'll be honest. I mean, there, there was, it was a dark point. But I was able to reflect back on my black belt test and a similar moment where in that test, I was considering giving up. And the face of a man who was in that test and showed me such love and compassion and empathy, but was also not willing to let me give up. And he helped me transition through that moment and realize that where I thought my boundaries were was arbitrary. I could redraw them. And I did the same thing in this business space. I didn't think I had the energy to keep going, to, to dig out from this hole I had put myself in. But I told myself, if you can get through that black belt test, you can get through this. And that's become a mantra in my life for a lot of things that my black belt test was, my original one, was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, hopefully it will remain the hardest thing I've ever done. But I can always reflect back on that and say, if I can get through that, I can do anything. So you've had countless now interactions with martial artists, instructors, other teachers, um, both from a professional standpoint with Whistle Kick, you've been at a myriad of functions, shaking hands with people, meeting people, having conversations and, and learning from people outside of martial arts. Yeah. So. Let's have you try and name someone, someone other than your instructors, 
that was an integral part of you becoming who you are today, sitting across from me? Yeah. Um, it's funny when I look over this question list, because I, I've put together this question list. It's been refined over the last however many interviews done. This is the one question that I never had any doubt how to answer, and it's my mother. Um, my mother's been a huge influence in my life and, and always will be. Um, and, those and those people that know me well personally know that that doesn't always mean it's a positive thing. Uh, my relationship with my mother is a little complex. I think we'll leave it there. But when it came to martial arts, she pushed me. She pushed me in a way that she didn't push me with anything else. I mean, she pushed me in everything. She wanted me to, to give my best regardless of what the thing was I was doing, whether it was, you know, stacking wood or skiing or schoolwork. You know, she, she had no problem with me even failing so long as I was putting in 100%. But something about whatever she saw in me when I was young in martial arts, she pushed really hard. And during the years as a teenager where I was competing heavily, she was my coach. She gave, she gave a lot of time. Um, and that was, that was tough. I mean, it was tough on both of us. And I remember going into the dojo and working my katas when no one was around um, on a floor that didn't have insulation in the middle of winter and my feet getting numb and her saying, one more. And it wasn't always a nice one more. Uh, anybody that remembers, you know, kind of the, the stereotypical 1980s Eastern European gymnastics coaches, you know, Bella Caroli and whatever, and them yelling at their athletes. Um, she had those moments. Uh, there was definitely a lot of motivation out of, um, out of an aggressive place. And I learned that same lesson from her that I learned through my black belt test just in a very different way. That wherever I'm drawing those lines, they can always be redrawn. There's always more that you can do. You can always do a little bit better. And I believe strongly that had I had anyone else as my coach during those years, the results would have been dramatically different and, and not in a positive way. You know, I'm not saying that those were easy years, but a lot of my skill in martial arts came from the attitude that my mother instilled in me, that refusal to accept anything less than my personal best. And that's where the slogan for the company, never settle, has come from. It wasn't, those weren't words that she ever used, but it, that was definitely the attitude that she instilled. It's pretty awesome to see that sort of early inspiration, early mentor also be your, your family member and have that come all the way through to your professional life and decades later be able to have such a meaningful impact on you. Yeah, and to be honest, I did not realize that that's where that came from until now. It was just something that hit me one day, and I even remember roughly when it happened, and I shared it with a couple people, and what do you think of this as a slogan, and they liked it. Um, but it's definitely from that mindset, and definitely owed to her, and I Well, she did a good her. job. Thank you. 
So I already know the answer to this question, so I'm going to rephrase this a little bit here. Sure. So competition means a lot of different things to different people. You can compete against yourself, compete against your friends, compete against other schools. It's all in the spirit of, of growing. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about a moment in competition that you felt like was probably your best competition? And I want to hear about a time where you felt like you were your own worst critic and you, you know you could have done better. And, and just tell us about those moments. Sure. A little polarization. Yeah. There. The, the worst one is easy and it's a moment I've reflected back on a lot because it's the one time I ever screwed up, really screwed up in competition. Um, and as we just learned, I hold myself to a pretty high standard. So to make an error in competition um, is hard for me to let go of. It was my high school talent show. Um, in front of all your friends. In front, of, yeah. So the the thing to remember, the thing that I think is pretty important to say is that, uh, as we've talked about on the show, I was the quintessential nerd in my school. Um, good grades, big glasses. Did an extracurricular that few others did, and and nobody understood martial arts. Um, tried to participate in team sports and did horribly soccer and not because I wasn't any good, but because nobody would pass me the ball because I was a nerd. They didn't want to pass the nerd the ball. Um, but my senior year, I finally started to figure out a little bit about who I was and have some friends. And so I was kind of coming out of my shell a little bit and willing to try some new things. And there was a talent show and some people I knew were playing guitar and doing dance and things. And I don't know if it was my idea, if it was somebody else's idea that, Hey, Jeremy, you should, you should do a martial arts routine. And I was like, oh, okay. So I came up with something completely new, choreographed it to music on my own. Um, my mother didn't like the song choice. So uh, what was the song? Um, boom, boom, boom off of the Jock Jams soundtrack. Oh, I, I, know, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, yep. Yeah, so here, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of keeping some show note ideas here. Um, so I, I will see if we can find that and throw that in there. Um, and I did it with a bow staff. And I got halfway through and I forgot it. I just, my mind completely went blank. And I threw the bow down and I walked off stage. And I just, I, I couldn't wrap my brain around the fact that that just happened because I had, at that point, you know, I'm a senior in high school. It's toward the end of senior year. I had spent years at a pretty high level competing, never had an issue. Now, whether it was because it was a newer routine, routine I didn't have a ton of practice with, uh, it was the environment, it was me being cocky, or that it was in front of my peers, I have no idea. I still don't know to this day. Um, I begged the person running the event to give me a second shot. So I went back out there, not a minute later, did it again and, and nailed it. Like from, from, from my vantage, it, it, it went the way it was supposed to the first time. Um, thank God they let me do it again. Because otherwise, I don't, you know, I would have had a really hard time. Um, best moment. So, forms are my thing. Sparring has never been my thing. I, I like, I like sparring, um, but it's just never been the thing that resonated for me. Probably from a, a similar place of that, you know, individual. Sports rather than team sports, kind of a place. 
and that's where I saw my success competing was in forms, be it weapons forms or, or open hand forms. And I'm going to guess most people have that are listening have seen a, a martial arts competition at some point. There, forms are scored; it's a subjective thing, and usually they'll say, you know. Each of the three, five, seven, whatever referees will award a score between this low score and this high score. Um, very rarely is it opened up to a full ten, because I don't know why it just it just isn't. So I was in this division, and I was I was coming off my heaviest year of competition. I was probably three quarters of the way through, and. they had set a, uh, an arbitrary high score of, of nine. And I, I came off and it felt good. And they gave the scores and four out of the five referees gave me a nine. And it wasn't so much the scores that, that mattered in hindsight, but just that feeling, that, val that feeling of validation for me in that moment that those people loved what I did. And it set the tone for me for the rest of that competitive season. And it's a moment that I think back on now when I do forms that I am capable of redrawing those boundaries of rising to whatever the occasion is. And that's why I love competition because I, I, I'm at my best when other people are going to observe me. I thrive on it. Yeah, I can imagine how a moment like that would just be so empowering to, to have people that probably don't know you, or if they know you, they only know, you, they know, only know of you, to be able to say, this person just did a fantastic job. This person just really showed us what it is to be a martial artist perfect score. It's, it's got to be an amazing moment. Yeah. So I imagine this, uh, the, the answer to this question may have changed over and over and over again. And this is probably circumstantial to what day of the week it is. <laughs> um, but if you could train with any martial artist of any discipline, alive or dead, who would you pick to spend your time with? It does change. Um, the one universal is that it always ends up being someone that started something, something that some style or whatever that passed down through. Because whenever someone has started a martial arts style, they have taken whatever they knew and either created things of their own or filtered out things that they knew. You know, they, they create this set of whatever it is. And there's a thought process that goes into that. And I don't think that we get that thought process a lot. You know, when we look at, at a martial arts style that goes back to, you know, the 20s or the 30s or whatever, None of those people that were around when it was formed are around now to tell us the whys. I mean, we have some writings and things, but I really dig that why. Um, so who, who would those whys be? Uh, Funakoshi is up there. Um, I would love to go super way back and assuming that our, our knowledge of this history is correct that uh, the body dharma brought martial arts to china and trained the monks i would love to be there then i'd love to train with him and say okay so why you know why was this the physical discipline that was important for the monks and not yoga you know not something else, you know, not, I don't know, some ancient version of parkour, 
You know, I mean, there's got to be gymnastics. You know, there's a lot of different things. And obviously, the combat element makes sense. I mean, that's a sensible thing. But I'm guessing it's more than that. So that's, I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd. And clearly, I'm still a nerd. And I like the whys. Why? Why are we doing jump, spinning, crescent kicks at the end of class and not the beginning when we're when we have more energy? I've always been a why person myself. I uh, some people take the question why as a challenge when really it's just curiosity. Yeah. Some people just have to know. Yeah. So I asked my wife last night, "Do you want to watch a dramatic comedy or do you want to watch a, a martial arts movie?" Because we both do martial arts. It made me happy that she she said martial arts, and so she can stay. Yeah, so she can stay. <laughs> um, I I love martial arts movies. They, um, while they're overly dramatized and fantastical, um, I love them all, even the really corny ones. Um, there's just such a great creative energy in it, and there is a lot of amazing martial artists that that are real martial artists outside of the movies. So I want to talk to you about movies. Why don't you tell us what your favorite movie is? And if your favorite actor isn't in that movie, I want you to tell us who your favorite martial arts actor is. Okay. Um, I love martial arts movies. Uh, I tend to gravitate more towards the bigger dramatic ones, the ones that have more kind of fantastic choreography. Um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon blew my mind. Right, I mean, just the choreography in there is absolutely outstanding. There's, there's an artistic element to it. And a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the story is wonderful. Um, that's not my favorite movie, though. And the irony is that my favorite movie doesn't have that quality to the fight scenes, and it's the original Karate Kid. Because it was the first martial arts movie that I saw. And it came out just after I had started training. Here I am, super young. My mom never took me to the movies. But we went to see this, and it validated what I was doing. You know, this is the early '80s, and, and I'm a kid, and you know, I just started kindergarten. I didn't know anybody else doing martial arts, but here on screen was this guy. I mean, obviously, he was older than me, and I recognized that, but. I could tell he wasn't an adult. At least he didn't look like an adult. You know, in hindsight, Rob Macchio was like 100 when he did that movie. Um, but I was still, even at that age, not... It seems weird to throw these labels on kindergarten, but I wasn't, I wasn't a cool kid. You know, I was still kind of on the outside. and. Um, to be validated that this thing that I was doing that was different wasn't just okay, it was good. And so that, that resonated for me. And, and whenever I watch that movie, I have that same feeling even now, even you know, knocking on 40, looking, watching that movie just makes me feel like I made the right choice to not just start training, but to continue training. Um, which Karate Kid movie yeah. is it with the bonsai tree? Where the is it? Is it two or three? Pretty sure that's two. Ever since I saw that movie, it had the the martial arts inspiration that the, all the Karate Kid movies have that really just sort of empower you that to believe in yourself. But I've always wanted a bonsai tree. But because of that movie and the respect in it, I've always told myself I'm not ready for my bonsai tree yet because I don't have the right place. And, and and it's they have these big lessons in those movies, and that's yeah. one lesson that stuck with me. It's like, don't bite off more than you can chew. Like I want a bonsai tree, but I know that it's 
It's not just like a movie where you can just go buy it and it's yeah. going to take care of itself. Well, the it's, first one has bonsai too. But yeah. I guess it depends on which scene you're talking about. You're talking about the and one that, where he climbs down. Yeah, he climbs to get down. It. Right. Yeah, yeah that's climbed, that's two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, there's a lot it's in there. Overarching themes that are that are that are inherently part of the martial arts and and people think it's just part of the movie, but that's really like right. That's really just just it goes all throughout, and I can totally see that connection. I I also love that movie. It's, it's great. There's there's magic in that movie that most martial arts films aren't able to capture. It's probably also the most referenced one. Mostly the wax on, wax off. Yeah. It's probably like the most. And the crane kick. And the crane kick. At the end. Yeah, and, those are. Um, but part B about my, my favorite actor. Uh, it's not Ralph Macchio. It's not Pat Morita. Um, and it's not Bruce Lee. Um, and that's shifted as well. Uh, in high school, it was Jackie Chan. Without a dad. Uh, without a doubt, I used to joke and tell people he was my dad. Um, because I was an awkward teenager and I thought that was funny. Uh, but as I've aged, I've gone more towards that artistic side and, um, you know, it's all, it's all Kung Fu practitioners. Um, you know, first it was Jet Li and now it's Donnie Yen and, and Daniel Wu because of the beauty in what they portray and we don't get a lot of really any karate influenced fight scenes or taekwondo influenced fight scenes that have that beauty as well as the the brutality Donnie Yen is one of my favorites he I haven't seen him yet in a in a movie that I did not enjoy, like every single one, even some of them aren't the best movies, but his martial arts are just so much fun to watch. Yeah. And I've also seen on YouTube a number of clips of him just training before the movies that are just wild. And he and his he his physique and his artistry are. They blow my mind constantly. He he is an amazing martial artist, and an ama and a really, it's hard to find someone who's an amazing martial artist and a great actor. Yes, and he's he's really got both. So it's it's funny that you're saying these things because I was in a group of martial artists um, a week and a half ago, and saying you know somehow we're talking, we start talking about movies or whatever. And I'm basically saying the things that you're saying, and I didn't know all of the people in this group one of them went to high school with him oh so i'm getting these donnie yen stories before donnie yen was donnie yen i mean this guy trains kung fu now and, and knew his mom and just was able to really fill in that early gap like the six degrees About, of separation yeah, yeah. super that's, that's crazy and in, in martial arts it's like two degrees yeah. if that yeah. uh, but it actually it made me respect him even more because uh, the you know famous people don't always talk about their their colorful past and his past was pretty colorful did you see that he's going to be in the star wars movie oh, yeah. one oh I, yeah i am so unbelievably excited that he's going to be in my favorite franchise. Um, I'm, it, it's, it's long overdue. Lightsaber, please. It's long overdue that we have someone kung fu centric in that franchise. Anyways, we could have a whole conversation we, about we Star could. Wars and Donnie Yen. We could. And hopefully but, we'll be able to yeah, after. Yeah. Maybe that'll be one of your other episodes. Where uh, we talk, we'll, we'll talk yeah, about Rogue let's One. Let's do it. Let's do it. So... We just talked about actors in movies. Um, some of us that take martial arts home with us and don't just and don't just do it once or twice a week, or some people that go a minute more than that, um, we like to read and watch at home. So the reading yeah. part. Do you have any books that stand out to you that you would say were influential or inspirational to you as a as a as a person and as a martial artist? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool about this show is that 
we get a lot of people on that have written books and they send me their books. Um, sometimes they'll just autograph a book and send it to me and I didn't even know who they are. So I have this huge stack of books that I'm trying to slog through. Um, some of the guests that have been on the show or that are pending coming on, up on the show have asked me to help edit their books. Uh, no, that is not an offer for the public. I did spend a couple of years as a, a professional editor. Uh, so I, I get first crack at some of these books. So that's really fun. But the one that had the most influence on me, we've talked about on the show a bunch, is uh, Zen and the Martial Arts by Joe Hyams. And, and I've said it on the show. I mean, that book was in our bathroom forever. I don't know. From the time I... It was probably in there before I was old enough to care about reading it. And it was there when I went to college. And I can't even tell you how many times I've read that book. Because there's these short chunks and just the stories in there. I don't, I don't even remember the stories because I haven't read it since. Uh, it's on my list to pick back up once I get to dig through some of these other books. But I just remember reading that book, or pieces of that book. And knowing how significant it was. And I don't think I got it back then. You know, you, you, you read something, you hear something, see something, and you don't recognize the significance of it. But again, this goes back to a time when I was so young, so impressionable, that those words are in there somewhere. I'm sure when I sit down to read it again, it's, it's going to all be familiar. It's not unlike the guy who went to high school with Donnie Yen and probably didn't realize who he was going to high school with at the time. Right. Yeah, you don't realize until you have 2020 hindsight. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've looked, I, I wanted to have the author, Joe Hyams, come on the show. Unfortunately, he's passed away. I'll have to add it to my reading list. So it's, it's a good book. Um, the other one that just struck me because it's it's so crazy that it's true um, is a killing art. It's the story of the founding of Taekwondo, and you know it kept coming up on the show, and people were suggesting I read it. I even bought it for one of my best friends as a, a gift, and he read it. And, you know, I was like, "You got to read this." So I finally sat down to read it, and just crazy killer book. Um, the author's coming on at some point soon. Uh, we, we've got, I think we have the date worked out. It's in the next couple of weeks. Because it's just such a mind-blowing story. Like, you could make, you could take that book and turn it into a movie and not embellish anything. And people would, would not believe it. They would think it was some exaggerated action thriller. I mean, just the amount of, of murder and scandal and and backroom deals it's like it's like a, a a korean version of of a born movie like it's nuts and so to read that and know that holy cow this happened and, and this is what people did because they loved some of them did it because they loved the martial art that they were cultivating so much you know i've, I've never loved anything enough to murder someone so I, I can't empathize with that, right? Sure. Um, but clearly they did, and that's just, that's crazy to me. So you've got a successful company that supports martial artists by making the best sparring gear and apparel. <laughs> Thanks. That's a plug for Whistle Kick, in case you were wondering. Um <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, so I, we don't usually do commercials in the so, middle. So that's that's your company, and your company has its own goals. It's its own entity, and and you're going to take that where you're going to take that. But for you, as a martial artist, do you have any? What's your next step? What's your next goal? As Sensei Jeremy, are you? Are, I was at your test recently when you got your, your promotion and are you looking to your next promotion? Are you looking to another discipline? 
Pr promotions are so weird. Um, because I think anybody that's spent more than six months in martial arts knows that rank and skill rarely correlate because it's about that personal journey, right? So my journey continues whether or not I put more figurative stripes on my belt because I don't actually have stripes on my belt. Um, I just want to keep getting better. Uh, I've always felt like the best analogy for martial arts knowledge is the wheel in Trivial Pursuit. So your first style gives you that wedge, but it's the biggest one. You know, you spend your time 10, 12, 20, whatever years in whatever martial art it is, and that's your foundation. And then as you train in other things with other people, you're adding more. You never fill it. You know, you're never shooting back for center for that final question to win the game. But there's always more you can learn. And the more you learn, it, it does two things. It unsettles what you've already learned and make, changes your perspective on some of it. But on the rest, it dovetails. You know, it fits in pretty well. Um, you know, taking karate and taekwondo and capoeira and judo and jujitsu and all the other things that I've done in seminars and classes and whatever. It's all different, but it's all the same. So I really enjoy adding to my repertoire to... I like that feeling of not knowing what's going on, that white belt feeling. It's such a, a, a scary thing. That's how I felt in your kicking class. You came to our school and got us all out of our comfort zone. And it was really refreshing because I've been teaching. I totally cool. relate to what you're saying. But I, I think that's where the magic happened. When you are scared of what you're, you're training, especially after you've moved past that. I mean, um, I, I was lucky enough. I was visiting a school last night and... It was this one woman's first night. Uh, her husband and her son train, and she'd been watching the kids' class for six months or something. And she got out there, and like you could tell she was nervous, but she was killing it. Like she was doing amazingly well because she just kind of jumped in with both feet and let it happen. And I think a lot of times as martial artists, and, and I do this my tendency is to go back to what I know and that's great, but you can't, one of my favorite things is you can't have progress without change. So unless I'm willing to change the way I'm doing things, I'm not going to grow as a martial artist. So I've got to be willing to operate in that place where I don't know things or at least don't know them super well. And the place where I find the most benefit is when I'm doing something completely foreign. I think it speaks volumes to you as a martial artist. Um, we study very different styles, but I know that there are some martial artists that lack the humility to put on that imaginary white belt again. To 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 they're they're in their their comfort zone and their own sense of what is right. And but I think humility is one of the best things that a martial artist can have because you're always a student and that's speaks volumes. Yeah, I don't, I'll, I'll agree with you. I don't know that I've, I fully agree with that word choice humility. I know where you're, you're going. Cause I don't, I don't know that it's always, I mean, for some, absolutely. And I, I know some people that their, their unwillingness to train other things definitely can come from a place of ego. But I think for a lot of them, it comes from their, fear of having that white belt feeling again that oh my god i don't know what i'm doing mm -hmm. because it's scary and the more time you spend in a position of authority of knowledge 
the harder it is, I think, to go back. And, you know, so that kind of wraps back around to what I was saying earlier that I, I really, rank is not a big deal to me. I don't define myself by how many stripes I put on my belt. Uh, anybody that spends time with me training knows that I, I can do some things and I can do some of those things pretty well. Um, Something you said early in the interview too is that um, I did my black belt, I can do anything. And I can hear that that attitude extends to, I can, I can be a white belt again. I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can do this. I'm not intimidated by this. That's, let's do it. Let's have some fun. Yeah, that's great. I'm, it's a, sounds like a really well-rounded goal to have, to be able to attack each of those things. I just like to learn, right? I'm a nerd. I mean, there's, there's the common thread for this whole, this whole episode. I mean, the, I, these episodes have threads as, as we start to unravel who a person is. And clearly mine is that I'm a nerd. I'm a martial arts nerd and I'm okay with that. I, I also use that word to describe myself. So I totally get what you're saying. So as we, as we round this down here, come to the close here, is there anything that you'd like to say? To all your listeners who've heard you talk to other people, but you haven't necessarily given us your voice. We've been hearing other people's parting advice. What, what is something that you would add here for Wait, all of our listeners? I'll, I'll answer the question that you're, you're meaning to ask, but before I, I think I want to kind of explain why. And um, I've done enough of these to recognize that I am far more comfortable in this moment now at the end than I was at the beginning. Right. And, and for most of the guests, there's some progression. Um, I didn't expect to have that. I figured I'd be good to go right from the go. Right. As soon as we start, I mean, how many hours have I done this? I mean, people that listen to the show, how many hours have I been in your ears? I mean, this should be old hat, but it's a, it's a completely different thing. So here we go. I'm uncomfortable. I'm a white belt in this situation. It's the first time I've ever been interviewed on my own show. It's not my show right now. It's your show right now. It's, I'm just I'm just here. Uh, and so I've been a little afraid through this. I was afraid getting going with it. There was talk of this happening, not, not with you. In fact, it didn't even go as far as me reaching out to someone to interview me. But there was talk about this being episode 50. And so I kicked it 50 episodes down the line. It's pretty wild. I feel like you just started it and we're and we're recording episode 100. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it's been it's been over a year. I mean, this is going to yeah. come out in July of 2016 and the first episodes came out the beginning of April 2015. So, was that 15 months? You know, it's a long time. Um, time flies when you're having fun. It does. It does. And I don't know if I answered the thing that I was posing. I think my train of thought may have run away. But I appreciate what it's like more now to be on the other side, to be the guest. And I'm guessing that this is going to make me a better interviewer now that I've been the interviewee. And I appreciate everyone's willingness to listen. And hopefully you've made it to this point at the end where I think I'm doing a better job than I did at the beginning. Right. Um, so advice. You know, it's funny, I always have these quick thoughts when I'm talking to guests. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good at responding. I'm good at playing the straight man in a, in a comedy duo. Like, I'm not, I'm not the guy in the front with my words, usually. So coming up with something to say is, is, is a little bit of a challenge. But I think, for me, it all comes back to time and recognizing time and that we have a finite amount of it. Earlier today, Facebook was suggesting to me this post that I had put up a year or two ago about time. And it's funny that this is still in my head. And what I was writing was that if we knew 
the exact moment that we were going to die. Even if it was, you know, we were going to die at like 110. I don't think people would take their lives for granted. I don't think we would kick the can down the road quite so much because the moment death becomes real, people do things really differently. I mean, you, you see that in some ways, you know, well, we've all, you know, so-and-so has cancer and we're looking at three to five years. I mean, that's a much longer diagnosis than a lot of people have. And yet it still changes their life and the way they approach time. Absolutely. And as you might imagine, running this company is, is busy. I mean, I haven't given up on the rest of my life. I mean, I still train. I still have friends and family and, and travel and do all these other things. So it's required me to take a better um, look at the way I handle time and making sure that my, the way I use my time, because that's all we have. If you go to a job, you're trading time for money. It's, it's a time bank. And if you say, well, no, there's, there's a skill there. Well, it, you invested time to acquire that skill. I mean, it's just, it's just time. It's all time. And I try to make sure that at any moment, the time that I'm investing in whatever I'm doing meets my goals. Whether that's growing this business, practicing martial arts, building friendships. If I'm not okay looking back and saying, I just spent 10 hours that I never get back with someone I don't like, I, I've messed up. I don't do that. Um, I didn't know this when I, I developed this personal practice, but Bruce Lee did the same thing. He would completely eschew social norms and just be completely rude and say, no, because I don't get that time back with this person. I'm not going to go do that. Um, so to boil that off into a, a, a nugget that you could put onto Pinterest, make sure your time is invested in a way that supports your goals. Thank you for listening to episode 100 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Sensei Jeremy for letting me sit here on this side of the desk. It was really an honor. If you like the show, be sure that you're subscribing or using one of the free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites. And if we find your review, and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for a free box of Whistlekick stuff. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may think. We'd love to get your feedback on our show. If you know someone that would be great to interview for the show, please fill out the form over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and pretty much everywhere else you can think of. Our username is always Whistlekick. And remember, you can find our products at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our versatile no-sweat athletic shirts. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. Until next time, keep learning, train hard, and never settle. I hope you all have a great day.